If you're religious in any sense of the word, you've heard the story of the ten plagues of Egypt. The Pharaoh refused to allow the Jews to return to their homelands, and as a consequence, God sent the ten plagues to punish the Egyptians for their wicked ways. The water of the Nile turned red, frogs ran rampant, gnats and flies took over the land. Then the animals started dying, people developed painful boils on their skin, and fiery hail rained down from the heavens. Next came the locusts, devouring everything in their path, followed by total darkness and a plague leading to the death of the firstborn. But were the plagues real historical events? Let's find out. Moses. Before we get into some theories and physical evidence of the plagues, we first have to ask a question that relates to the topic. Was Moses a real person? If Moses was just a made-up character, then all the other questions we might have about the plagues would become obsolete. The story of Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, is arguably one of the most important events to take place in the Bible. You know, besides the birth of Christ and his crucifixion. The story of the Exodus is the most frequently mentioned occurrence in the entire Old Testament. Throughout the years, it has been referred to over 120 times in stories that come after, as well as poems, laws, historical writings, and prophecies. Since the Exodus supposedly took place, there has been a continuous 3,500 years of unbroken Passover celebrations. The Exodus is such an important event in Hebrew history that it's hard to believe when some critics say it might not have really happened. So what evidence, if any, exists to prove that this monumental event took place in the ancient past? Well, for one, there are pillars on either side of the Red Sea that supposedly mark the very place the people of Israel passed over during the Exodus. But I'll get more into that discovery later on in the video. So what else is there? One interesting thing about the Exodus story in the Bible is how it includes Egyptian words. When Moses was a baby, his mother put him in a basket and placed him in the river. Moses was eventually found by the daughter of the Pharaoh who was bathing in the river. She saw how helpless the child was and took pity on him. She then raised Moses as her own son. This was supposedly all part of God's plan. Egyptologist James Hofmeyer points out that the Hebrew word for basket comes from an Egyptian word. So do the words for bulrushes and pitch. Even the word for river is a transliteration of the Egyptian word for the Nile. Who knew? Moses' name itself is Egyptian, given to him by the Pharaoh's daughter. This suggests that Moses might have had an Egyptian education, which helps explain why there are Egyptian words in the story. That also means that Moses was likely literate, able to read and write. Back in the 19th century, biblical scholars didn't believe that Moses could have written the first five books of the Bible. They thought he couldn't have possibly accomplished such a feat because they didn't think there was a writing system back then. But of course, now we know they were wrong. At the beginning of the 20th century, examples of alphabetic writing were found inscribed on stones at an Egyptian turquoise mine in the Sinai. Sir Flinders Petrie was responsible for the discovery. The writing dates from the 19th to the 15th century BC. Some of these inscriptions, according to Douglas Petrovich, provided clear evidence that they were created by the Israelites. His translation of one of the inscriptions, written in Hebrew, contains the name Moses. Some scholars remained unconvinced by this evidence, but it seems like more than a coincidence that alphabetic script would be developed right around the time the Israelites were in Egypt. If you're still not convinced, don't you worry. This next piece of evidence may do the trick. When you think of Moses, what do you imagine him holding? His magic staff, of course. Well, maybe it wasn't magic. But Moses definitely used it to perform miracles, like parting the Red Sea. So have we found this legendary staff? It really depends on who you ask. According to writer Graham Phillips, there's a staff on display at the British Museum that could be the same staff wielded by Moses. The official story is that the staff belonged to a man named Tut Moses, an Egyptian official. Right away you can see how similar the name is to Moses. The names would almost be identical if it wasn't for the Tooth at the beginning. And these guys didn't just have similar names, they had similar lives. Like Moses, Tuth Moses was raised in the Pharaoh's palace. He was also expelled from the royal court and was sympathetic to the plight of the Jews, who were working as slaves. The staff, which is engraved with the name Tuth Moses, was found in southern Jordan in the 1800s. 
It was recovered from a tomb and was immediately handed over to a British collector. The museum then added the staff to its collection in 1952. It could be that before Moses became, well, Moses, he was called Tut Moses. That was his Egyptian name though. Maybe after leaving Egypt he chose to change his name, opting for the Hebrew translation, dropping the Tut thereby becoming Moses. The spelling of his name likely changed over thousands of years, and now he's simply known as Moses. What do you think? Did any of this convince you that Moses was a real person? Let me know in the comments. And now for number 7. But first I wanted to give a big shout out to Stable Stone and Jason Hughes. Thanks so much for watching and supporting OE. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. PR Nightmare the Egyptians were diligent when it came to recording their history. They took note of every event, whether it was religious or secular in nature. But for some reason, there are few references in Egyptian literature to the alleged plagues from the Bible. Why do you think that is? A wicked pharaoh ruled at the time the plagues decimated Egypt approximately 3,500 years ago. It's highly debated, but most biblical scholars would agree that the name of this pharaoh was Ramses. But which Ramses he was isn't clear. And like every pharaoh before him, Ramses claimed to be a divine being, the son of Amun-Ra, the sun god. At the time, the Egyptians believed that Ra not only manifested himself into existence, but that he also created the entire universe. Every pharaoh claimed to be the offspring of this celestial being, and the emergence of the plagues, well, complicated things. Imagine believing your whole life that the leader of your society had divine power, and was able to communicate with the creator of all things. You follow him because you believe that he has the power to perform miracles, like making it rain in times of drought and making the sun rise every morning. But then that pharaoh is exposed as a fraud. He has no power over the elements and no connection to the divine. That sounds like a PR nightmare. When Moses tried to free the Jews and the pharaoh refused, the ten plagues would have burst the bubble that the past pharaohs and Egyptian elite had so meticulously crafted. The pharaoh couldn't protect the people of Egypt. They were at the mercy of some otherworldly force that, until then, had not revealed itself. It would be as if the Vatican was suddenly exposed for lying about the very foundations the church was built on, making everyone question their beliefs and denounce their trust in the Pope. So that explains why there isn't much mention of this catastrophe. The Egyptians recorded almost everything. That's true, but when it came to their failures, well, they omitted certain details. According to Egyptologist James Hofmeyer, the plagues aren't well documented because royal inscriptions didn't typically record disasters, and they certainly didn't record any type of setbacks experienced by Egypt or its royal elites. Most Egyptian texts only mention their victories, and this is so common that one might think they never lost a single battle. This could be why we can't find much documentation on the Ten Plagues. But some evidence does exist. Ipua, an Egyptian sage, wrote a poem that details the horrific plagues falling on Egypt. The papyrus Leden, sometimes called the Ipua Papyrus, on which the poem is written, dates back to the 13th century BC. However, there are reasons to suspect that the poem itself may be far older. The language used in the text fits within the language used between the 16th and 14th centuries BC. The name Ipua also originated in this era. So what exactly does the poem say that connects it to the Ten Plagues? It speaks of the river becoming blood. It mentions how poor men became rich and vice versa. It also talks about disease running rampant, affecting both man and animals alike. In the pyramid texts, there's reference to the death of the firstborn. Another mention of this event can be found in the coffin texts. Both of these accounts say that day of slaying the firstborn. While we don't have strong evidence for the ten plagues, there are breadcrumbs that point to this biblical story being a real event, and the evidence only gets more shocking from here. Pillars and chariot wheels. The Passover story from the Bible describes the last plague, the death of the firstborn. God told Moses that he would strike down the firstborn son of every household to teach the Pharaoh a lesson. So Moses warned his people, the Jews. He instructed them to mark their doors with the blood of a sacrificed lamb to distinguish themselves from the unrighteous Egyptians. 
And when that fateful night came, the Lord passed over the homes of the Jews and didn't harm their children. It's alleged in the Bible that it's the final plague that convinces the Pharaoh to free the Jews he had enslaved. His oldest son dies and suddenly he has a conscience, resulting in a short-lived moment of mercy. As the story goes, the Pharaoh changed his mind and chased after Moses and his people. Moses parted the Red Sea, allowing the Jews safe passage, and once they're all safely on the other side, Moses returns the sea to its original position, drowning the Egyptian soldiers in the process. At least, that's what the Bible claims happened. But it turns out that some archaeological evidence may support this account. In 1978, a granite pillar was discovered by Ron Wyatt at Nueva Beach in Egypt. It's the only beach in the area that's large enough to host two million people. It's huge! And based on the inscriptions on the pillar, it may be the very place where Moses and the Jews crossed the Red Sea. The inscriptions are written in Hebrew, and according to some, they describe the story of the crossing. The words Pharaoh, Yahweh, Moses, Death, and Solomon are etched into the pillar, suggesting that it was King Solomon who commissioned it. And get this, there's a second pillar that was found directly across from the first one, on the other side of the Red Sea. And if that's not enough evidence for you, check this out. Chariot wheels have also been photographed at the bottom of the sea. Ron Wyatt was responsible for this discovery as well. Wyatt was searching for gold on his boat using a molecular frequency generator, which is a fancy word for a metal detector. He picked up readings at the bottom of the Red Sea, and when he dove down to check it out, he found golden wheels that could have been part of the Egyptian army's chariots. The Bible says that 600 choice chariots made of gold were wiped out on the day of the Exodus. Could this and the pillars be physical proof of the plagues of Egypt? or at the very least, evidence that Moses and the Jews crossed over the Red Sea. I'll let you decide. Volcanic Eruption Theory The sun goes black, the sky turns grey, locusts devour the earth, leaving no crop untouched. People go hungry, and animals begin to die off. Am I describing the plagues of Egypt? Or am I simply describing the aftermath of a devastating volcanic eruption? Well, two things can be true. Sometime between 1620 and 1600 BC, the island of Santorini, located in southern Greece, experienced a natural disaster that would have resulted in catastrophic consequences. Volcanoes spewed smoke, ash, and debris into the atmosphere. Microbiologist and author Ciro Trevisanato describes this in his book The Plagues of Egypt, Archaeology, History, and Science Look at the Bible. Trevor Sonato also argues that some ancient Egyptian medical texts support his theory that the plagues were really just a fallout of a volcanic eruption. It's important to note, though, that this theory doesn't align with the most accepted timeline of when the plagues occurred. Most biblical scholars agree that it's more likely that the plagues happened sometime between 1279 and 1213 BC. With that distinction out of the way, let's get into Trevor Sonato's theory. In his book, Trevor Sonato says that the wind would have carried volcanic ash to Egypt sometime in the summer. The toxic acids in the ash would have included cinnabar. Cinnabar is a mineral that's capable of changing the color of a river, making the water appear more blood-like or red. And all that unwelcome acidity would have killed the fish and caused frogs to flee from the river in search of clean water. Without clean water, crops, humans, and animals would die. And in their rotting carcasses, too numerous to count, insects would burrow their eggs. With nature thrown off balance, insects would multiply to the point of being a nuisance in every facet of life. Then the volcanic ash in the atmosphere would begin to affect the weather. Acid rain would fall down on the survivors, burning their skin and causing boils to form. The rain would also contaminate any surviving plants, like grass, effectively poisoning the remaining livestock. The humidity from all that acid rain would have created the perfect conditions for locusts to thrive. The volcanic eruptions of Santorini could also explain the darkness that fell over Egypt. Are you convinced yet? Well, we haven't even gotten to the most convincing part of Trevisanato's argument. So if you're still on the fence, listen to this. In the London Medical Papyrus, as well as the Ebers Papyrus, there are treatments listed for burns caused by dissolved acids. 
These burns are consistent with burns sustained as a result of ash fallout and acid rain. The London Medical Papyrus contains 23 treatments for burns, and one of them describes how a specific type of lesion couldn't be treated by rinsing due to the red waters of the Nile. It also states that left untreated, the lesions would generate larvae. Additionally, the Ebers Papyrus mentions several ailments that correlate with the inhalation of toxic substances like coughing and asthma. But surely these ancient Egyptian medical texts don't line up with the Santorini eruption, right? Well, actually they do. The Ebers Papyrus was completed in 1550 BC, and the London Medical Papyrus dates to between 1550 and 1295 BC. If this timeline is correct, these texts were written by the people of Egypt who were directly affected by these so-called plagues. But if you believe Trevor Sonato's theory, they weren't plagues at all. They were simply the consequences of a devastating volcanic eruption. Let me know your thoughts about this theory in the comments below. Red Algae Aside from the volcanic eruption theory, most estimates place the ten plagues happening during the reign of Ramses II, between 1279 and 1213 BC. During this time, Egypt's climate changed from being wet and tropical to being more desert-like. The Nile, which was once filled with fast-flowing water, suddenly morphed into a muddier, slower river, and this unfortunate evolution would have given rise to a very specific type of algae. This theory, proposed by Greta Hort in the 1950s, suggests that algae turned the Nile red, giving the plague a more rational explanation. But is algae really that deadly? Well, according to Hort, yes. Not all algae is toxic, but the type of algae that affected Egypt was. I'll only say this once, but Hort believes it was specifically Euglena sanguinea and Haematochus pluvalius algae. These types of algae are extremely toxic and could have been responsible for the death of Nile River fish. The toxicity in the water would also have forced frogs to evacuate. Another theory involving algae put forward by German biologist Stefan Fluchmacher states that burgundy blood algae may have been to blame. It would account for the same reddish color of the water, as well as the death of fish and the fleeing of frogs before they also kicked the bucket. This algae hypothesis also makes sense when considering the next several plagues. When the frogs died, it would have left no natural predators to keep the local insect population in check. As a result, insects like fleas and flies would have flourished and multiplied like crazy. Just picture the amount of flies that somehow make their way into your home on a warm summer day. Now multiply that number by a thousand. That's likely the amount the people of Egypt were dealing with. Insects are known to carry diseases, and with so many insects festering around toxic water, they would have become effective killing machines, spreading sickness to every living thing they touched. Livestock would die off, and the Egyptians would experience illnesses they never would have dealt with before. Other plagues, like the Black Plague that ravaged Europe in the 1300s AD, were known to cause boils on the skin or open wounds and lesions. These afflictions fall right in line with the sixth plague of Egypt. What do you think? Does this theory make sense to you? Could algae really be to blame for all the chaos that ensued in Egypt? Let me know in the comments. Locusts When you think about the plagues of Egypt, which one do you think was the most annoying? Sure, the three days of darkness would have been horrifying and rather inconvenient. The Nile turning red was likely a shock, and the destructive hail would have made young lovers rethink their picnic plans. But the plague of locusts is arguably the most annoying of all the ten plagues that cursed the people of Egypt. If you don't live in a place that's festering with these flying demons, you should count yourself lucky. Locusts are technically grasshoppers, but not all grasshoppers are locusts. So what makes a locust a locust? Well, according to Rick Overson from Arizona State University, it all comes down to a superpower that locusts have that allows them to go through a genius switch in development. Most of the time, locusts only exist in their grasshopper phase. They live solitary lifestyles. They're green and fairly unremarkable. But when they unlock their superpower, they reach what biologists call the gregarious phase. Like a butterfly, the locusts go through a transformation. They don't retreat into a chrysalis, but their brains change, their color changes, and so does their body size. 
Their powers are unleashed when environmental conditions are just right. This is usually when there's a lot of moisture in the air and excess rainfall. When this transformation happens, the locusts are no longer content with being alone. They start attracting one another, and if conditions persist, they can form huge swarms that can be downright devastating. Now let's get back to the Ten Plagues. The locusts were the eighth plague to decimate Egypt. They covered every tree and ate up everything in their path. But did you know that locusts have always been a problem for people living in Africa? Egypt is in Africa, if you didn't know. In 2010, Kenya reported the worst outbreak of locusts in 70 years. Tens of billions of these flying critters invaded the country, bulldozing pastures and destroying crops that farmers worked tirelessly to cultivate. Where these swarms exist, anywhere from 40 to 80 million locusts can be packed into an area measuring just half a square mile. They become these dense dark clouds the size of small cities or football fields. One particular swarm in Kenya in 2020 was reported to be a whopping 25 miles long by 37 miles wide. Between 1954 and 1955, locusts did about $50 million in damages in the Sumasa Valley alone in just six weeks. And in 1958, Ethiopia lost enough grain to feed a million people for a year, around 167,000 tons, all thanks to locusts. Published accounts of locust invasions in North Africa date all the way back to 811 AD. But of course, we know that swarms have plagued the country for far longer, as accounts can also be found in the Bible. As you can see, locusts have always been a nuisance, especially to people living in Africa. It's not that much of a stretch to think that Egypt would have experienced periodic locust invasions during ancient times. And given the nature of the first seven plagues, one can see how locusts would have been drawn to the area. The hail that rained down on the land was accompanied by flashes of fire, which could have been lightning. And where there's lightning, there's a storm. Most severe storms are coupled with strong winds, and wind can carry all sorts of things along with it, including large swarms of insects. If the storm was blown into Egypt, so too were the locusts. While there may not be much physical evidence that this was the case, there are enough modern cases to back up this theory. Maybe it wasn't God that sent the locusts, maybe the wind was to blame. What do you think? The Leonid Meteor Shower But what if the hail wasn't just caused by a huge storm? What if the hail was really just a meteor shower? This is the exact theory put forward by Muhammad Omar Suleiman to explain the seventh plague of Egypt. In a paper published in the Journal of International Meteor Organization in 2008, Suleiman explained that every year in November, the Earth passes near the orbit of Comet 55P slash Temple Tuttle. This astronomical event results in the star's fall, which is better known as the Leonid Meteor Shower. The Leonids are considered to be some of the fastest moving meteors. According to NASA, they zip through the sky reaching speeds of 44 miles per second, not per hour, per second. The Leonids can sometimes result in impressive fireballs, producing long, illuminated meteor streaks across the heavens. Normally, during these meteor showers, just a few meteors fall every hour. But in the years that Comet 55P slash Temple Tuttle is closest to the Sun, the Earth passes through the most compact section of its dust swarm. This causes something called the star shower occurring about every 33 years or so. And occasionally, the shower transforms into a spectacular meteor storm, causing thousands of meteors to fall every hour. The most recent of these storms happened in 2002. Another took place in 1996, and the same thing happened in 1833. But in 1833, something miraculous happened. Instead of the typical thousand or so meteors every hour, estimates and reports stated that 100,000 meteors per hour rained down on the planet. Can you imagine seeing something like that? It would seem as if the stars themselves were falling from their fixed places in the sky. Some folks might have thought the world was ending. But what does this have to do with the plagues of Egypt? Well, I'm glad you asked. Mohammed Omar Suleiman theorized that the seventh plague, the hail, happened during one of these meteor showers. And similarly to the shower in 1833, Egypt witnessed something remarkable. Suleiman claims that the plagues happened in the year 1226 BC and that the hail fell on August 15th of that year. Exodus 9.24 in the King James Bible reads, 
So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. Now I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like a description of a meteor shower. The tails of each meteor would have been recognized as fire by the Egyptians, and yet they still called the meteors hail. This could be because, at the time, they didn't have a better word to describe it. The Bible claims that the hail was so powerful that it shattered every tree. But what kind of hail could do that much damage to a tree? Maybe smaller trees would fall, but certainly any type of hail that could literally shatter a fully grown tree must raise some eyebrows among biblical historians. The timeline of some of these cosmic events taking place in the far past is difficult to follow. This is likely because the words used to describe such events have evolved so much in the last hundred or so years. So could this hail from the story of the Ten Plagues really have been meteors crashing to Earth? Well, I'll let you decide that one for yourself. The Darkness In Exodus 10.21, God told Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. This was the ninth plague, and it lasted for three days. What the Bible says about the plague of darkness is interesting. The description not only depicts Egypt being without light, but it also says that the people could literally feel the darkness. Have you ever gone outside at night and felt the dark? No? Okay, so it's not just me. But let's think about this rationally for a moment. What sort of natural occurrences can make things appear dark? Well, an eclipse blocks out all sunlight, making the day appear as night. But eclipses don't last three days, as the plague of darkness lasted. Storms can darken the sky as clouds pass in front of the sun, but the Egyptians definitely would have been able to describe a storm. You have the volcanic eruption theory, which honestly has a lot of evidence to support it. But what else, if anything, could have caused a tangible darkness, one that could be felt? Author Josef Bitten published an article in January 2024 describing what he believes could have taken place all those years ago. The Bible implies that this plague paralyzed Egypt. It says that people couldn't see each other, even from a close distance. Nobody left their homes for those three days of darkness. Whatever caused it, the story doesn't only depict the mere absence of light. Yosef Bitten cites Rabbi Abraham Eben Ezra in his article. He says that Ezra theorizes that the Ninth Plague might have been caused by a very thick fog. This intense fog could have originated from the Nile River, and if you remember what I mentioned about the locusts before, they were likely brought in during a storm with strong winds. This could have led to a change in temperature, causing fog to spring out of the river. Bitten recalls his own experience with a particularly dense fog while visiting the forests of Monteverde in Costa Rica. He said that the fog caused complete visibility loss and produced a darkness that could physically be touched, which is exactly how the Bible describes the plague. When the plague of darkness happened, the people of Egypt chose to stay inside. But if it was just dark outside, why didn't they simply light some lamps or fires? It could be because the fog was so thick, it extinguished any flame immediately. That would be quite the predicament to find yourself in, don't you think? Now, let's refer back to some of those ancient Egyptian medical texts I brought up earlier. The Ebus Papyrus, in particular, mentioned several remedies to treat asthma. Balsam apple, frankincense, and sesame are among the herbal remedies used to treat this ailment. But what does asthma have to do with fog? Well, fog can sometimes induce asthma. Or for people who don't struggle with asthma, fog can make you cough. And wouldn't you know, there are also remedies for forms of coughs listed in the Ebers Papyrus. A fog from the Nile following the other plagues wouldn't have been your average fog either. It would have carried with it all sorts of diseases and toxins. And maybe that's what led to the final plague, the death of the firstborns. This is just a theory, but it does sort of make sense, doesn't it? What do you think really caused the three days of darkness from the story of the Ten Plagues? Was it a volcanic eruption, or was it just thick fog? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And while you're at it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now. Number 10. The Beheading of John the Baptist the beheading of John the Baptist was one of the most gruesome actions of the Bible. 
In the New Testament, John the Baptist was imprisoned by King Herod of Galilee during the days the Holy Land was under Roman Empire control. He was imprisoned because he was outspoken about Herod, divorcing his wife, and then hooking up with his sister-in-law, Herodias. What's truly interesting about this story is that it's told in great detail in the New Testament by Jewish historian Josephus. Modern historians believe this was a real event and that it likely happened just as described in the Bible. John was imprisoned, and then Herod had him killed at the behest of his brother's ex-wife and his new bride, Herodias. However, it wasn't just his killing that was gruesome, it was the way it happened. The whole affair likely went down around the year 28 AD following a feast at the fortress of Machaerus. It was Herod's birthday and Herodias' daughter asked what Herod would give her as a present. Herod said he would give her anything, but it was all a ploy. The birthday girl then asked for John the Baptist's head. This was all part of her mother's plan, and so the king had no choice but to chop off his prisoner's head and present it to the girl on a silver platter. Number 9. The Ten Plagues of Egypt In the book of Exodus, the Israelites were being kept prisoner by the Pharaoh of Egypt. God wanted the Hebrew slaves to be released so that they could return to the land of their forefathers. God figured the best way to convince the Egyptians that he was in charge was by unleashing ten terrible plagues. First came the Plague of Blood, with the Nile River being turned into sticky, gooey blood that stank like death and was unable to be consumed. Then frogs started jumping out of the bloody Nile River, invading people's houses and causing general froggy chaos. Next, gnats were sent to plague Egypt, and then swarms of flies. God said that the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies, and even the ground will be covered by them, and it just gets worse from here. Next came the pestilence of livestock, and then the Egyptian people and their animals were covered in boils. They had to undergo the worst hailstorm that had ever befallen Egypt, and the sky shook with thunder. Locusts were released into the country and allowed to devour everything in sight, leaving the Egyptians without a scrap of food. The Lord then said that darkness will spread across the sky, and he blotted out the sun for three full days. Lastly, the angel of death was sent to take away the firstborn son of every Egyptian family, including the cattle. The plagues were barbaric and horrifying, and many people died in the story, but in the end the Pharaoh finally relented and allowed the Hebrews to leave. It was only after he freed them that he changed his mind and tried to get them back. This was when Moses parted the Red Sea, and the Pharaoh's army drowned trying to chase them. Number 8. The Suffering of Job Job suffers a lot in the Bible, more than most. He becomes the unwitting victim of a bet between God and Satan. Job was a good and decent God-fearing man, considered one of the most devout followers in the land. Satan argued that Job only worshipped God because he lived an easy life. Satan said that if God took away all Job's belongings and struck down his children, he would stray away from the path of goodness. This was a bet God knew he could win, but Job didn't have the slightest clue what was going on. Job had his flock stolen, his property was taken, and his children were all crushed when his house collapsed. Still, Job refused to curse the name of God. Satan then started torturing Job. He covered his body with boils and sores, causing Job immense agony. However, through all of the tribulations, Job never denounced God. Where this story gets truly horrible is that God never gave an explanation for why he would kill Job's family and make his life miserable just to win a bet with the devil. It seems unnecessarily cruel. Even though God did bestow Job with more children to replace the ones he lost, that couldn't have possibly taken away the devastation of losing the first batch. He already lost his original three daughters and seven sons. Plus, his wife had to give birth to another ten children. Number 7. Slaying the Canaanites The book of Joshua details what most religious scholars believe was the genocide ordered to be carried out by God himself. It happened after God called forth his people from Egypt back to the land of their ancestors. But at that time, the Canaanite civilization occupied the land of Israel. And so, God demanded that every man, woman, and child living wrongfully in Israel be mercilessly slaughtered. The Israelites then carried out God's command and went from city to city destroying every last person in the ancient kingdom of Canaan. 
This particular story does not sit well with a lot of people for one main reason. God appears to order the indiscriminate bloodshed of innocents, a sort of ethnic cleansing to allow the Israelites free access to their lands. This wasn't really something God was known for doing in the Bible. He was often depicted as callous and unwavering, but not a senseless murderer. One of the ways Christians have defended the genocide of the Canaanite people is that they say the Canaanites were sinful monsters. We see their sinful ways mentioned a few times in the Bible. The Canaanites were supposedly morally depraved, intimate with everything from their own siblings to their own livestock. They were said to have bathed themselves in the blood of innocents and sacrificed children to their pagan gods. And so, by this reasoning, God didn't order an innocent genocide. He was wiping the earth clean of a clan of monsters. Number 6. Sodom and Gomorrah when it came to God's fury, the Canaanites were not the only ones who suffered. In the book of Genesis, we learn of two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. These cities were thick with sin, wicked to their very cause, and were mentioned in most biblical texts from the Old Testament to the Quran. In the story from Genesis, God is presented as a reasonable, omnipotent being. Abraham was afraid God would destroy the innocents along with the wicked, and so he asked God what he would do if there were even 50 righteous people found between the two cities. God said that he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if he could find some goodness within the cities, but unfortunately, he didn't find much. He couldn't even find 10 righteous people, and only discovered one good man named Lot, his nephew, and his family. And so God did exactly what he promised he would do. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by sulfur and fire. As the angels carried Lot's family to safety, Lot's wife looked back at the city and was consequently turned into a pillar of salt. Which of the ten plagues do you think would be the most devastating if it happened today? Let us know in the comments, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button! Number 5. Biblical Cannibalism There are a lot of references to cannibalism in the Bible, and nobody is really sure why. There is no specific cannibalistic villain, but there are a lot of passages talking about people eating other people. Psalm 27 2 says, When evildoers eat up my flesh, it is they who stumble and fall. In Micah, there's a passage that says the Israelite leaders don't care for their people and that they skin them alive, chop them up, and use their meat in the cooking pot. Even Jesus told people that they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and in Leviticus, God warns the Israelites that if they disobey his commands, they'll be forced to eat the flesh of their own sons and daughters. There's a similar passage in Jeremiah when a prophet says Jerusalem will be attacked and those trapped inside will eat their friends, and of course, their children too. It's clear the writers of the Bible had a serious fascination with cannibalism. It can be found everywhere, suggesting the act of eating one's friends and family in desperate times may have been a little more commonplace than anyone thought. Number 4. The Mysterious Hand One of the stories in the Bible is of the great king Belshazzar, last crowned ruler of the Neo-Babylonian Empire until his death at the hands of the Persians in 539 BC. The biblical story takes place at a banquet thrown by the king for his nobles and the powerful people of Babylonian society. He commands that the goblets that were stolen from the Temple of Jerusalem be brought to the feast so that he and his concubines can drink from them. As the king and his concubines laugh and drink the wine, they praise the gods of gold and silver. As they praise these false idols, a mysterious human hand appears out of nowhere. The hand has no body and it crawls along the wall and leaves a written warning on the plaster. Only King Belshazzar can see the writing on the wall, but he can't understand it. He has to summon Daniel, who can speak Aramaic, to read the warning for him. The message translates to, Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. This means the king's days are numbered, his soul has been weighed and found impure, and his kingdom will be divided. That night, the king is killed in his sleep. The Persians take Babylon, and the empire falls. It's from this story that we get the expression, writing on the wall. Number 3. A Legion of Demons There is an exorcism in the Bible performed by none other than Jesus Christ himself, and the details can be found in the book of Matthew. 
Jesus was moving through the region of Gadarenes when he came across a pair of men that were so hopelessly possessed by demons that they had turned into violent monsters. Nobody could continue on the trail because the men were crazed and raving mad. But, of course, Jesus wasn't worried at all. He approached the possessed individuals, drove the demons out of their bodies, and sent the demons into a herd of pigs. Each man had been possessed by their own legion of demons, and so Jesus easily yanked each one out and threw it into its own pig. Then he sent the whole herd of pigs tumbling down the embankment of a lake where they splashed into the water and drowned. The men were saved, the pigs were all dead, and the demonic entities were sent back to hell, where they belonged. Number 2. The Amalekites The Amalekites were a nomadic desert tribe that most likely lived between Egypt and Canaan in what we now call the Negev Desert. This mysterious tribe had different names. They were called Sut by the Babylonians, and sit you by the Egyptians. According to the Bible, the tribe was unrelentingly brutal. They hated the Israelites with a passion, and in Deuteronomy we see how they attacked the Israelites as they fled Egypt. When the Israelites were weary and exhausted, the desert tribe invaded them and tried to crush them. The Bible goes on to say that the Amalekite tribe joined forces with the child-sacrificing, blood-drinking Canaanites to try and defeat the Israelites once and for all. They were constantly attacking Israel, disrupting their food supply, and destroying their land. And so, yet again, God orders a genocide. He tells King Saul to attack the Amalekites and utterly destroy them for their trespasses. God specifically says to kill the men, women, children, and even the infants. He says every last cow, sheep, camel, and donkey needs to be obliterated. However, King Saul failed to obey God's commands. He slayed a lot of people, but he allowed the Amalekites' king, Agag, to live. The Amalekites continued to bother the Israelites up until they were destroyed alongside the Persians and the fabled King Xerxes, as told in the book of Esther. Number 1. The Witch of Endor the Witch of Endor is one of the more mystical and frightening characters in the Bible. According to the Book of Samuel in the Old Testament, the Witch of Endor was a necromancer. She supposedly had a talisman that bestowed her with the power to summon the dead. When Saul, the first ruler of the United Kingdom of Israel, needed help defeating the Philistines in battle, he sought the help of this sorceress. Even though necromancy was considered a crime in ancient Israel, Saul was desperate for any advice he could get for destroying his enemies. He first tried to consult God, but he didn't receive an answer. And so, pressed for options, he summoned the witch. Saul was hoping to summon the spirit of the prophet Samuel. Saul believed that if he could only speak with the prophet's spirit, he could be given a prophecy of the future and therefore know how to win his great battle. But unfortunately, this did not go well for Saul. Rather than be given information that could help his conquest, he was given a prophecy of doom. The spirit of Samuel told Saul that his army would be defeated and that he and his sons would be dead by the next day. Saul collapsed out of sheer terror, the witch was sent away, and the next day came. Saul's Israelite army was defeated just as prophesied. Saul was wounded and he ended up falling on his own sword. It was a last desperate move to escape the shame of what he had done by seeking the help of a known necromancer. What's your favorite terrifying story from the Bible? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.